Hi, I'm Aaron from Dragon Wrath Innovations, and welcome to my second video on turning with the mill. The first video I did was just to demonstrate the simple turning operation of using a single lathe tool, and this is the part I made here, a simple sort of chess piece looking part. But what happens when you want to take the next step and be able to use more than one turning tool in the same CNC operation? The method I've come up with to be able to do this is using the work coordinate system of the mill and assigning a work coordinate location to each of your lathe tools. Uh, the simplest way to use more than one tool is going to be tool tools and you're going to have one clamp on each side of the same vise and you're going to have the tools 180 degrees oriented and this will require you to make a couple of modifications to the g-code for the second tool but if you are using a cutoff tool which I suppose is probably going to be the most common use for this and it's only going to be two or three lines that you need to modify, so it's not too bad. Now, I've already set up lathe tools in the vise, just so I will go ahead and show you the tools I have set in the vise, and I will explain to you how I set those tools in the vise. Okay, as you see here, I have my vise with two lathe turning tools in it. As far as assigning the work coordinate system location is I use a chamfer mill where things might get confusing through this is to keep in mind that doing this your part location and your tool locations are reversed so when you're entering a part location in the mill what you're actually telling it is where your tools are so just to keep in that in mind as you go through and it'll help you uh, avoid any unnecessary confusion but I will go ahead and drive my chamfer mill back down to show you just how I line it up with the lathe tool. I keep the Z height at least 30 to 40 thousandths above the lathe tool and I just eyeball it and it's working great so far. Whether or not you're comfortable doing that is up to you. Another fantastic option would be an electronic edge finder that you do not have to rotate in order to use it. Um, this will allow you to get a very, very accurate location of the tip of the turning tool in its position in the jaws of the vise. So I'm going to go ahead and drive that transfer tool in tightly and then I will show you what it looks like up close. So as you can see, the center of the chamfer tool is lined up over the tip of the turning tool and this gives me my X home position for that work coordinate system location. Now how you're going to transfer that into your cam is under, by understanding that the center of that chamfer tool lining up with the lathe tool means that the center line axis of your spindle is lined up with the lathe tool. So whenever you do part setup and stock set up in your cam you're going to use your reference point as the center of the stock the center of the face of the stock and what that will do is give you a very good uh, accurate cut diameter wise and it'll give you good shapes and good good um, facing finishes and all that so that is the X lined up now I'll show you the Y lined up now there are several schools of thought with regards to the setup of a turning tool to your stock um, some would say to line it up dead center I prefer to have the turning tool a couple of thousandths below the center of the stock it's a much safer place to be if you're not 100 percent accurate it is better to be lower than higher um, and that's just the nature of the beast if you're higher then your cutting edge could end up being above the point of contact of the stock which means that the stock will be rubbing against the cutter below the cutting edge and you won't cut very well and you'll generate a lot of heat and all that is very bad so as I said just a couple of thousands above and now how you need to reference this if you want to see this this is how you would be looking at it if it was in a lathe consider the chamfer tool as your stock so when I say lower that's that's what I mean is that the cut edge is below center line of the stock if it were in a lathe so that's the setup right there and I will show you the control side so now this is the work coordinate 
system display for my machine. This is running Centroid MPU 11 as a control interface. You're, what you're looking at specifically here is up here in the corner WCS1. So that is the location of my first tool is work coordinate system location 1. Now for me switching between locations is down here next WCS gives me WCS number 2 so we'll go back to WCS number 1 and now I've zeroed out that tool for X and Y. Z you're not going to do quite yet you're going to have to do the Z um, with the stock in place and I'll get into that a little bit later but this is WCS 1 so now I go to WCS 2 and I will dial in the other cutting tool Go ahead and zero this one here. So now I have both of my tools loaded into the control. The location of each tool is now loaded into control. And for my control, it is just that simple. So now that my X and Y are homed for each tool in the work coordinate system, I'm going to go in and load my stock. And I will set the Z height to each tool in each work coordinate system location. So now I have my stock loaded in the machine. I had to turn the stock down a little bit with a belt sander, but not too much. My The stock I get is usually 5 to 10 thou over, so you may have a similar situation if you choose to use an end mill holder. Now ideally you would either have a lathe chuck, a small lathe chuck that you could arrange through uh, collets or adapters to install in your spindle. You may not have that option. Um, your other option is as I'm using an end mill holder um, but in between I would say would be a collet. Um, I would say a collet is a better bet than an end mill holder. I do not have a collet that's readily available in that size so I'm using an end mill holder but it gets the job done. You just want to tighten your set screw down really, really tight on that end mill holder and always be careful. When trying something like this, use slow feed rates until you get used to how things work. Now that the stock is loaded, I'm going to go ahead and drive stock down and set the Z height for each work coordinate system location. So now my stock is set to the Z height to match that tool. Make sure you're on Z. You don't want to reset your other ones while you're at it. So set. So now the second tool knows or the, the control knows where the second tool is relative to the end of the stock. So now I'll go back over and do the first tool and I will change to work coordinate system one. So now I set my Z height for the first tool in work coordinate system one. Z height set. And that is it for the control side setup of the tools. The tools and the lay and the stock are now referenced to each other in the control. So we can go ahead and get to into running tool paths, editing the G code and making So here chips. we are back in or the same part I used in video one that I made during video one for the turning tool. So we will be using that toolpath already made and then adding the cutoff toolpath. So um, one thing I like to do um, from my perspective you, you may or may not do the same. I always, when setting up toolpaths, like to keep the front view of the uh, rendering in the CAM program so that I always have a uh, real reference in comparison with the machine itself as to where the tool is and where the toolpath is going. Um, 
in the machine, the tool will be over here facing you in the cam. In the cam, it is on the right side facing away from you. And that is going to vary um, probably with different cam programs. It may or may not work the same way in other programs. But um, that's how it works for me in my particular case for Fusion 360. So that is the original original toolpath. Now, um, if you're using uh, 360, the easiest way to do this is to simply duplicate the setup for the turning tool. Um, when you're using a second tool in the opposite side of the vise, you'll duplicate the setup. And in the second setup, you want to edit. Once it's duplicated, you want to edit the setup itself. And you want to set your WCS, your work coordinate offset. Um, to the offset you used for that second tool. And that, as well as flipping the x-axis, is what you will want to do. So pretty much anything I machine. The first time I run the program, no matter what it is I'm making, I have my hand on that feed rate knob. And until I'm comfortable with um, the work coordinate system setup and the tool setup and everything else being where it needs to be, they call it the sanity check, until I'm comfortable with that, my hand stays on that feed rate knob. And I will not remove it because it is not worth crashing a machine. Not when, you, uh, not when you don't have a half a dozen, when you have one or two machines, or one in my case, you can't afford to crash a machine. Um, that ends your, ends your good times. So that is the second setup, and I went ahead and I generated the uh, cutoff tool path. So I had to make, add the tool. I did not have the tool added into the program, but it uh, looks pretty much the same as the tool I have. Mine has a, a little bit of an arch to it to uh, form around the stock. But um, that's not too big a deal. You just want to make sure that the size of the stock, if you're using what is actually a grooving tool like I am, that uh, it, it will have the, um, it won't plunge to the point where the, the tool holder is hitting the stock, obviously. Um, in that case, it may be beneficial to, uh, with the bigger stocks, to use an actual cutoff blade. Um, but I, I really like this tool. It's uh, the grooving tool. It's very sturdy, uh, very rigid, very reliable. So. I use it for cutting off too whenever the stock is small enough to tolerate it. So uh, yeah, I can go ahead and um, what I will do is I will re-simulate the toolpath from the first video very quickly just so you can see how that worked out if you did not watch that video. So here's the turning. I'll speed this up a bit and bring it so that this is what it would look like in the machine, in my machine in particular. So I'll play that for you and this is sped up quite a bit. Speed it up a bit more. So there it goes. One thing you have to get used to is the fact that um, while in the rendering, the tool is moving up and down. In the mill, it will be the more than likely the spindle that's moving up and down in the uh, table. So at least if it's a, a, um, a bed type machining center like I have, or a, um, a, a knee mill, the spindle is going to be what's moving up and down. So uh, yeah, there you have it for that. And I will move on to the cutoff tool path now. So I will go here. Let me close. I have to close that rendering to open the other one. So let me go here. And now you see how it flipped around to the other side? Because that is how the tool is loaded in the other side of the vise. Now um, you may notice one thing is that uh, with this tool path, this is actually how it looks in the machine. Well, in the rendering right here, I'm looking at the back side of the part. In this rendering, I'm still looking at the back side of the part, but that is also how it looks in the machine. So at the end of the day, you can use this as a good reference to see if you have it, if you have your axes set up correctly to do this. But if I go out and look at the machine right now, this is what I see. So it's very good to see the same thing in the program, even though I'm looking at the Fusion rendering from the back. Um, You'll trial and error a couple of times with that slow feed rate, as I mentioned before, and you'll become comfortable with knowing that um, it's not going to smash the machine or do anything crazy. So here is um, 
the cutoff toolpath. Very simple as cutoff toolpaths are. In fact, too simple to really see at that speed. So, yeah, that's how cutoff blade works. Pretty straightforward. It plunges in all the way through the part, and the part falls off. Um, cool thing about that is you could have a, um, if your tool is high enough inside the mill, you could put a little box or a little catch of some kind, a basket, so that when it parts off the tool, it falls in and lands nicely. You could put a pillow or a pile of feathers. Who really cares? I mean, it's so cute. But I just thought that was pretty neat is that you could part off the tool and have it fall into a, a little place where you know where it will be. Rather than having it bounce across into the base of the machine or across the shop, yeah, you don't want to do that. You want to have something under the, underneath there to catch it. So, uh, yep, that's that. And uh, we have the tool path generated now, both tool paths. And here's where things get interesting, is these are two separate setups. So what I'm going to have to do is hold control for setup one and setup two. So now you see they are overlapped, and I'm going to post-process, or rather simulate, both of them at once. And let's see how that plays out. Again, I'll speed it up. Let me slow it down. And it parts off the tool. And beautiful. That tool should be laying in a little basket under the um, tool holder after the job's done. So now that I've uh, Rendered both, I am confident that it will do what I planned for it to do, so I will once again make sure both setups are selected, very important, and post-process. Multiple setups with different WCS settings have been selected. Your post must be customized to handle your setup such that the tool is clear of parts and failures and fixtures when moving between different work offsets, machine zeros. What that means is that um, I'm going to have to inter insert a line and send it to home in between the two positions. So I will post that and um, I will meet you at the machine. All right, so now we have all our stock set up done in the machine. Stock and tooling is set. Uh, the part we used from the first video designed and the first tool path from the first video and we added the second toolpath for the cutoff tool. Now I have loaded that G-code into the control and I will show you the editing that you need to do for the G-code before running the job. Now we go here and we have the first code I already edited here. The simplest way is the header. Now uh, lathe post-processing is going to have a different header than a mill post-processor one key being that mills are going to want to zero to home the z-axis so raise the spindle up and out of the way or if it's the case of lowering the table down and out of the way regardless of what it is you are going to want the spindle to be clear of the vise and everything right at the beginning of the job so what I do is remove the lathe post-processor header and cut and paste a mill header in its place. So you have G90. Now here's the big difference right here is that if you are running uh, circular interpolation on your mill, if your mill can do circular interpolation and you have this G-code fed into it, normally this may be G17 which is going to have the circular run along the uh, X and Y axis. Now with the lathe you are going to want it to run its circulars on the X and Z axis. So normally a mill will run X and Y and it may change. It may do X and Z, Y and Z. But normally it's going to run X and Y which is G17. You want to change that to G18 so that when the lathe does its circulars it's doing them along the Z and X. So that's G18, you have G20, G28, G91, and Z0. That is going to, that is the code that clears your mill spindle away, up and away from your vise and other fixtures. 
But after any time you run a G28, you also want to run a G90. You want it to go back to absolute because G, if it's still in G91, the coordinate system, it's not using the right coordinate system within the mill. It's using the mill's natural coordinate system, if, if you will. The G90 sets it back to the part coordinate system, which is what you want for using work coordinate system locations. So then you want it to be T1, tool 1. Um, Any time, you will not assign more than one tool number to each lathe tool. They will all be the same, tool 1. Because you're not changing tools as far as the control is concerned, you're changing work coordinate system locations. So you want to keep it as T1, tool 1, regardless of what tool you're using. And here is where you show your work coordinate system location. So tool 1 is using WCS1, so that's G54, and my control tells you right there that G54 is the G code for the work coordinate system location that you're currently in. And then it just goes down into the lathe G code. I'm, I'm running at 1500 RPM, so on and so forth, and this is the code for the turning operation. Now we go down here, and one thing that I do and that I strongly recommend is after each turning tool job, reinsert that G28, G91, Z0, and then G90. And what that will do is after it uses the one tool before going to the next coordinate with the second tool, it will raise, again, raise that spindle up and out of the way. You do not want it to cross over to the other work coordinate system without having enough clearance to do so. That could end very badly. Now, one thing more that has to be added, and this has to be added both to any, any tools, is your lathe post processor code is not going to have any Y coordinates. Well, when you change work coordinate system locations, you are going to want to zero that Y. Now, you could choose how you want to do if you want to make a separate line just to do that. I simply put it, add it into the rapid movement as it rapids towards the beginning of the location before the before the tool path I just enter right in there a Y0 dot and what that will do is that will center the Y axis for that work coordinate system location and that if you don't do that if you leave your Y elsewhere then when it starts approaching the part or rather when it starts carrying the stock towards the tool it could contact the vise it could contact the tool holder contact anywhere else but the cutting edge, which is where you set your WCS home location is to Y0. So you want a Y0 right there. And that will get it over that WCS Y0. And then so on and so forth. So, and then once again at the end of the job, I again reinserted that G28, G91, Z0. So that once it's finished, it does what a mill does and sends the Z axis up and out of the way. Now that's that. We'll save those changes. Now, here we go. Before running any job, one last thing you want to do is graph. Now, graphing, running a turning operation in a mill, is going to look a bit confusing compared to what you're used to seeing. But I'll explain it through here. So, here is the first turning operation. And this is how you want it to look relatively. So, the rapids are coming down and then going up and beginning the tool pass here. And I can redraw that. Just like that. Now, this may look a bit confusing because you know that your stock is pointing down, which means the end of your tool is down. So why is it that it, the, the shadow, the silhouette of your part is up? That's how you want it to be because you have to imagine that this is your stock coming down, going over and making contact and then being fed down. So the yellow lines are not movement of a tool, but the movement of your stock, where if you're used to using this kind of a display in your mill, you know that it's the movement of your tool, but it is not so in this situation. So you wanna make sure that this is how it looks. With your part right side up, the end of the stock should be up, and this is going to be your cutoff location at the bottom, which is counter to how it would be in the mill, but this is how you want it to look. Uh, and one thing you want to be absolutely certain of is that it does match the silhouette of the part 
the lack of toolpath to match the silhouette of the part rather than the other way around. If it's the other way around, if it's the darkened area that comes to a point, then your toolpath is reversed and you need to flip your X axis. So now we are looking at the cutoff tools toolpath. Um, now one thing that you may not notice, which is incorrect about this toolpath, is the movement of the part. So the part comes down from here through the rapid and that's where things go wrong is that how this looks the part is coming down and then moving to the left towards the tool and that is the opposite of how we have it set up in the vise and to make sure you're oriented right I have my uh, X positive is it right as you can see on my little compass there so and the reason for that is that um, when you're using one tool in each side of the vise the cam doesn't really have a means of adjusting for that for the um, for the toolpath generation but being that it is just a cutoff toolpath it is not that difficult to edit so we will go in here to edit the g-code again get to the bottom here alright so we have here is what we're editing is we need to mirror the X movements we need to reverse them rather and one thing I'm going to edit right here, just real quick, is the cutoff tool. I have it running way too fast. I do not want, not, not want to run a cutoff at 1500. So I'm going to cut that down to 1000 RPM. And I can keep my uh, uh, 2 inch per minute feed rate. So 1000 RPM, 2 inch per minute feed rate. But that's neither here nor there. All right, so now we have our X axis movements need to be reversed. So X 0 0.9, I'm going to turn that to a negative. 0 0.9. Now we have a, a negative 0 0.591. I'm going to remove that negative and again add the negative. So what that does is correct our, our part travel. So that's it's it's rapiding to the right location here to begin the job, and it is feeding in the correct directions from the correct locations. Editing is done. We can save it. Go back to graph. And now you see that's feeding correctly. Let me zoom in, zoom in there. Now you can see the part will feed down and then the table, rather the tool will feed towards the part from the right. That is correct. So now that adder is all said and done. Everything is set up correctly. We are ready to make some chips. So I'd like to thank you for watching and I hope to see people trying this method out and see if they can get a handle on turning with a mill it is a neat uh, neat technique to be able to use um, if you have any questions or need any further help feel free to ask in the comments below um, other than that enjoy the cut